I actually thought that we could begin with an epigraph, as the work itself actually begins with a couple of epigraphs, and also maybe to immerse ourselves a little bit in the poetics of the work. So it's an epigraph that I happened to find in a book that also made me think about the work. Um, and the epigraph, or the, the quote, is actually from Ursula Le Guin, the speculative fiction author, the great late Ursula Le Guin. And the quote is as follows. I am not proposing a return to the Stone Age. My intent is not reactionary, nor even conservative, but simply subversive. It seems that the utopian imagination is trapped like capitalism and industrialism and the human population in a one-way future consisting only of growth. All I'm trying to do is figure out how to put a pig on the tracks. So what I think Ursula Le Guin does in this wonderful quote is sort of get us thinking about sort of the critique of capitalism and industrialism and capitalist time as this sort of progress-driven narrative. And then all of a sudden she says, all I'm trying to do is figure out how to put a pig on the tracks, right? To disrupt that sort of forward-thinking imagination or that narrative that we think we know. And this is what I kind of think the interval or the concept of the interval does. So sort of as an opening, I thought, hey, could you guys tell us, since it's an experiment in intervals, how you're conceptualizing the interval and how you're, you know, it's an applied methodology specifically to this project. Um, so we both came across this idea uh, a couple of years ago. Thank you so much. So independently and together in the kind of philosophy that we were reading as we were traveling, uh, we started to understand, oh, that won't be necessary, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the interval, the interval uh, was an idea that we came across in both uh, feminist philosophy as well as, ooh, what would we call it, this critical theory, um, and it was in relation to this discourse between what is utopia uh, in a patriarchal sense where utopia is considered a fixed place. Utopia is a world that is perfect and you can build it and you can build it into the architecture and lock it in and it's going to be perfect forever so you never have to change it. Uh, and Elizabeth Gross, uh, who we refer to a lot, uh, she speaks about how that type of a utopia and a patriarchal utopia is always verging on dystopia um, because it doesn't have room for the potentiality of uncertainty and the potentiality of, of not knowing. Um, so we started to, understand, the more we looked into this word interval, um, we also found that it was applied to uh, philosophy that spoke between architecture and the body. Um, and maybe what I um, I guess the way uh, that I kind of looked at it more is not necessarily as a subversion or as um, like a, a um, an opening but more like as a punctuation more as like almost like a comma or a pause and that kind of allowing you to to kind of enter um and i think it's good. so yeah. it doesn't necessarily so i think i think the feminist kind of uh, perspective of it is very much like we're subverting this kind of patriarchal ideology um but it's been written in kind of different ways and we use uh, Derrida as one of the sources and he's this more I, I feel it's a little bit more of a gentle approach where he's kind of looking at it very much as like a, a space kind of like an opening of space yeah. and we, we reference it in our first piece yeah. um, in experiment in intervals two uh, where he kind of says that it's it's the becoming space of time and the becoming time of space and so it's kind of like you, you, you start to play with this kind of um, spatial, spatial temporal openings. So, when we found, like, when we were looking at these types of ideas, the reason that they were coming about was to say, well, how do we subvert the patriarchal utopia, uh, which is basically what we see in like 
uh, sites of empire, sites of colonialism, or any type of sites where a really strong ideology has been imposed into the architectural framing or the, the scape of the site. And so your body sort of becomes complicit or those ideas become imposed upon your body and whatever that ideology said that you are, uh, you unknowingly become it as well by being in the, in occupying those sites. Um, so when we came across this idea of the interval as a way of rearranging what that site can be for you through the way that the body is able to interact with it, uh, it also led us to, um, towards a, a, a broader school of feminist utopia, which is that utopia is a process. Uh, it's a utopia of process and it's a way of, of being able to work with unpredictability uh, and uncertainty and the alien, so in this case the monstrous, uh, to be able to create a new narrative about what, what an identity is or what, it, what the body is within this site. Um, and I think in terms of the spatio-temporal arrangements, so the interval is just this one moment or this opening where uh, the improvisational body and the phenomenological body so that it, it, it goes in there and is, it kind of disrupts through its own aliveness um, and not necessarily in an action against or in an action in, in contradiction to, but uh, in, in a way of uh, sort of saying, well, this is not the, the, linear, the, this, the linear narrative of this ideology is not what, we're not even going to acknowledge it into presence. So we exist in, in between that in this interval as in anything. You know, and as a potentiality, we can unpack that a bit more. I think. <laughs> no, I think that. Thank you for for introducing us to your conceptualization of interval. And with that, of course, we have intervals within this piece. So I thought that we could talk about what actually you've seen and sort of break that down. So beginning with the first interval, which is directly sort of citing the 1964 film by Miguel Angelo. Antonioni's um, Red Desert from 1964, his first color film. So just to contextualize the film for those who haven't seen it, it basically follows the story of a woman who happens to be a mother and a wife to a factory owner, and it takes place basically amidst um, heightened sort of industrial production, right? It's this horrific sort of vision, dystopic vision of industry at its height poisoning the environment around the lead character, Juliana, who throughout the film we sort of see her enacting sort of a neurosis in relation to this site, this environment that is sort of inflicting her with this neurosis. So that happens to be just the film as a reference. But this you decided to reference quite, quite literally within your work as the first sort of interval. And you actually begin the epigraph actually of that are the last lines that are spoken throughout the film, where you basically have the mother and the son talking about the smokestacks and the sort of poisonous smoke that is arising from the smokestack. And the mother, or the little boy asks the mother where all the birds are. And the mother says, well, the birds don't come anymore. Or the boy asks, is the, is the, is the smoke poisonous? And she replies that, yes, it's poisonous. And that's why little birds don't fly there anymore. So just to contextualize, that as a film, that as the epigraph, and then here we have Violet Desert, yes? Um, so please, if you could talk a little bit about why Antonioni's film. Uh, so I think the moment that I kind of came onto the site straight away, it just reminded me of that, of that film that I'd seen. And I, I'm not sure I liked the film initially. Um, it was quite confronting. But then when we watched it together, I um, I kind of enjoyed it a little bit more because I, I think I was looking for something in it um, and it uh, we kind of used it as a re as a reference as a we needed I feel like some ground in that site because the, the site there is so vast and you kind of you don't even really know what to do with it and so the film kind of gave us this uh, well initial kind of narrative of this of this woman who's suffering from this neurosis and unable to adapt and seemingly because of that like uh, it's almost like she's the problem um, because she can't really adapt whereas everyone else seems to be kind of okay so just to clarify is so that the woman she can't she can't adapt to this industrial modern life like she they her, she's married to a man that live they live on basically an industrial site that looks very similar to this 
um, and there's a lot of uh, alienation that you see her go through because it's that it's that it's in the 19, 1964. So it's that initial period where yes, everyone's living in big houses by themselves in sites like industrial parks, um, where there are these architectures like spewing gas and whatnot, and it's it's quite antith antithetical to what you might imagine is your like suburban home and, and living. Um, but yeah, so we, we the, the character, you know, in his film, and this is possibly a critique, like she's, the, her neurosis is sort of uh, seen as something, by, by everyone else in the film seems to think that she's falling apart in a way that doesn't make sense. But at the same time, as a viewer, it also feels like it's the only thing that makes sense, is that to, to live in such an alienating environment uh, is the only thing that uh, is a sane thing to, to feel um, and, and or sane way to respond. So yeah, the, the jacket, the jacket, and her walking through. Um, I mean, I, if you walk into the site, I don't know if you guys have been walking around uh, on the industrial sites much, but it's quite lonely and it's quite isolating. Um, and initially, that just happened to us anyway. We got onto the site ready to shoot, and we were. We were kind of just, yeah, like Vlad said, just felt like there was this swallowing, it was the site was swallowing us up in its flatness and deadness. Um, and instead of fighting back at the start, we just let it alienate us and let it isolate us. And, you know, I look quite sort of bored and lonely walking around in that initial phase. And I think that psyche of, of uh, Juliana from the film is alive in all of us as we kind of occupy these sites that we don't know, really know what that site is trying to make us. You know, it doesn't really quite make sense. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I, I read it differently of, of, of it, especially the way that you're citing it. Like in, in the film, we really see decay as a verb happening. Um, there's something about citing it now that seems like, well, if you're amidst capitalist ruins, what survives? Um, so it actually feels strangely alive in a different way than, than it does in the 1964 film. But there is something about this parallel between Juliana's um, unproductivity and your unproductivity that I think is a similar critique also as an interval. Um, within the film, like, Juliana's supposed to have a store that she's supposed to do something with, but she never, she never produces anything, quote unquote, throughout the film. And it kind of cites like this banality that you're talking about, and just thinking about it also as an interval, right? If, if we're amidst uh, the site, the utopic site of production, of, of, of progress, of progress, right? Yeah. But you're not producing anything. You're just in a strange now assemblage of things. Um, there's a parallel, but I do think that there is something very um, animating um, that's happening in Violet Desert that is not necessarily referenced for me in, in the original Red Desert. Yeah, I think I think in both pieces the the site is very much another character, um, and it's uh, what were you saying? Like uh, I think in in Red Desert it, it feels very antagonistic the site, right? Especially to her, mm -hmm. um, and you can really see that contrast. And I think in in Violet Desert. Uh, it's, it's less antagonistic and it's a little bit more like they kind of like move through each other and I think when when I was filming it it was a little bit like I kind of didn't even know what to film like was I filming the site was I filming the body was 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 it somehow both and so a lot of the frames it were initially like very confused um, and it's, it's like I was I was looking for this kind of perfect frame and I couldn't quite find it yeah, I think that that um, that discussion between the body and the site and Juliana is like, well, this is a reclamation as well, and this site doesn't have to be dead and uh, oppressive. Like it is, there is an instant sort of reflexivity for all of us to be around all this industrialization and feel quite oppressed by it. But also that what we started to sort of find on the site was that there's moments of opportunity there as well. Um, and it's the context of how, how you're seeing yourself in the space and, and how you see the space as well. Yeah, I've got your initial question though. No, you know? no, yeah. you guys are, it, 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 it's just a riff, yeah? yeah? yeah it's yeah. just a riff. Yeah. But, but just to that point, because we, we had a conversation yesterday, an ambivalence, an ambigu the ambiguity came up. And I think there is this ambivalence also to, not this um, 
okay, if we see the capitalist narrative as a, a shit show, horror show, right, um, that we all kind of know, like it's as old as the beginning of industry and capitalism is sort of that critique, then it's as if we know that narrative, right? Or the opposite, you know, instead of progress, okay, let's, this romance of like anti-industry, anti, like reverse, let's go back to nature. And there's something about being in a site amidst capitalist ruins that is neither, <coughs> yeah? It's neither of those narratives, which as the third thing, you're sort of opening up for us to, to sort of, and also with this, of uh, this not uh, there's no real protagonist, quote unquote, in each of the frames, allows that relationality to sort of, I think, pop through in the world, just as a thought. Um, Maybe, maybe there also I'll ask you, because it's so directly cited, maybe just a little bit about sound and the sound that you guys decided to use. Yeah, yeah so um, we had a cellist from Australia that we were, was initially going to work with us for the work, um, but they had an issue in like very, very close to production time. Um, and we were lucky enough to find Roxana Albayati, who is on uh, residence at Zaratan uh, in Lisbon. Uh, incredibly talented cellist, um, and uh, she, yeah, she, so she recorded samples for us after watching the film um, and speaking to us about the, the thematics, and then we, we edited that. Um, so that's the, the cello that's playing, um, and the voice, the sound is actually uh, so you know, when there's a, there's a frame where I'm, I've stuck my head into the drum, and you can just see, yeah, so. I sang in, that was actually whilst I was singing, I was singing inside the drum, uh, and the tune is the same, uh, it's, a, it's a riff on the tune in Red Desert, um, which there's that interesting, I, what's the fact about how, when, that, that, in the film they only use on that twice. song, yeah. Yeah, it comes on twice, so it comes on in the beginning, um, and the, the image is very, is very industrial, and it's like factories, but at the same time you have this kind of operatic uh, voice. And then the other time is during uh, Juliana's uh, story to her to her son about this uh, girl on a beach, and again you have this kind of um, this operatic sound. Yeah. It's like of her imaginary. It's it's the part that you know I think for us started to feel like was getting a bit otherworldly from from where it was. So um, as she was singing, I mean she didn't know it, but I was filming her. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. I felt like we had to include it. Interval two. <laughs> um, so you begin with this epigraph that I would love you guys to unpack. Um, and it's, it, the epigraph is, monsters cannot be announced. Um, please, if you could unpack that. And, and with that too, a little bit about how you're thinking about this notion of monstrosity. <coughs> yeah. So just to, the, the idea of monstrosity in a classical sense would come from uh, a, a classical form of a person and maybe their offspring is deformed in some way, has an extra arm or an extra leg and this was considered a monstrous thing to happen. And that monstrosity is seen as a, an, in, in a binary to the divine. So it's sort of, it's the, the devil's spawn kind of thing. Um, but it was also conceived, uh, conceptualized that when something monstrous happened, it was that the perfection of the, the father's DNA was overwhelmed by the unruly feminine fertility. Uh, and that's why the extra arm or the extra leg or something would happen. Um, so that was in a sort of traditional sense of how monstrosity was seen. Um, jo uh, Bataille, George Bataille, who uh, we, we cite in the work, um, so he took, on, took monstrosity to apply it to architecture and, and said, what is most monstrous and what is most the spawn of the not divine and un what is ungodly is this industrial architecture, is this is the smokestack, you know, uh, and, and how it's spewing forth this smoke from the ground into the sky um, and sort of said what's actually most deformed is this, this type of, uh, that, this, that we've normalized this um, and that this, we've fallen so far from our, our human nature uh, that we've, we've uh, unfolded, given birth to this monstrosity uh, in, in this architecture. Um, the quote that we use um, is, monsters cannot be announced, uh, and it's by Jacques Derrida. And I'll let 
Do you want to? No, yeah. So um, Derrida talks about, so this in relation to monsters, says, well, you, the moment you announce a monster, it becomes a pet. Um, and what he's referring to is here is that when something, I mean, to, for want of a better term, when something ungodly happens amongst us, as soon as you go, oh, it's just industry, oh, it's just commerce, oh, it's just blah, 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 you've immediately normalized it and brought it into, into a kind of acceptable way of being. Um, but the other thing that you've also done is that by identifying it, you've taken away its power to transform. So as if you go into whether it's uh, a, the, of the body or of an other, uh, when something is alien, um, when, you, when you rob it of its space to remain alien and uncanny and, give, and categorize it, you take away the potentiality for something else to happen and for an alternate future to come from it. So we really wanted to look at monstrous architecture in this piece as something and, and monstrosity. So if, if we are all the offspring of neoliberal capital, capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, everything, maybe we're monstrous. Okay, maybe we're hybrid, maybe we have extra things, maybe we don't fit into the classical mold, but instead of that being a monstrosity, maybe that's an opportunity, um, or we see it as an opportunity. So, yeah. That's, a, that's why we put um, the write-up of uh, Bataille, uh, the little kind of excerpt that he has about the smokestack and how he's talking about how terrifying it is to see that. And so you've got on one hand this like, terrifying idea of monstrosity and we kind of wanted to turn around turn it around and uh, use monstrosity as an opportunity as an opening um, and that kind of speaks to that thing of monsters can't be announced um, again because the moment that you define it it's gone right um, and uh, with Barra what, what is it that she kind of says I'm not sure remember? we'll come back to it now yeah. about We'll come back to it, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. But, but to this, because we, we spoke a little bit about it yesterday too, and I thought this was uh, just a very uh, uh, specific sort of clarifying image also about the, the monstrous and, and the, the, the abandonment of the monstrous too, maybe not, you know, to get on beyond the, the announcing is also the abandonment. And mm -hmm. when we had talked about this site, for example, the way this site, the abandoned site, as the monstrous site, is sort of then always looking towards Lisboa. Right. right. So because from, from the industrial park in Barreiro, which is obviously yeah, like this sort of wasteland and it's been abandoned, uh, you can see Lisbon on the other side. It's always in the sun and it's gleaming and all the boats are going past. Uh, and it reminded us of this discussion about yet yeah, monstrous, monstrous being that yet yeah, there's the there's the two children, and one is the perfect one, and it's the perfect looks like the father and has two arms, two legs, and everything. And then there's the deformed one, and the deformed one knows that it's monstrous because it can see the perfect one, and it knows what it can't be or what it's not because it can see that. And every time we were on site, we could see Lisbon across that side and see all the factories and kind of and these broken architectures on this side, it really felt like that was the, these were the two offspring that were kind of playing that dichotomy out. Um, with, within this theme, or within the second sort of interval, maybe we can also talk a little bit, just briefly, about temporality, because so much of the second interval is sort of these mo motifs of reversibility, of coming undone, of undoing. So how you were sort of conceptualizing that, I think it becomes strongest for me in that interval, but, but in general. Uh, so, I mean, if, if in the first chapter, it was very much about kind of introducing the side, introducing, you know, the body, or kind the of character, even the yeah. character, whether it's Juliana or uh, just the body, yeah. the female body. Um, the second one is very much, so there's, a, there's now, like a strong kind of interaction happening um, where it's not so much, again, uh, the contrast between the two. Um, it, it's much more kind of like uh, there's this un unfolding that kind of happens and it's, um, I don't know, it's a little bit more, I don't know. Yeah, like we wanted to create an ambigu ambiguity about whether something is being born yeah. anew and breaking out, or whether something is returning back to what it was. 
and undoing itself. And it's like, well, both of those things have to happen at the same time, actually. Um, and I think it's it's tempting to want to kind of, uh, like a, a lot of the ideology of activism or revolution is often like, oh, we're just gonna like trash everything and like break open to this brand new thing that will be perfect. Or that we just need to undo all of the bad stuff we did and go back to some purity that we had. And I, we kind of wanted both of those things to happen at the same time and still live in this kind of ambiguity so that what is born is still a form that doesn't necessarily neatly fit into either of those narratives. Um, so that I think the temporality that... Also, there was a kind of funny thing of just walking around on this site and getting undressed and redressed and, you know, it was like what we were doing on the site was really alien. So that it, it just kind of fell out of that where I was like tying my hair up on the side or putting my shoes up on the side and it's so abandoned and it's so derelict and you know but I'm dressing myself in it and it's there's a there's an absurdity there that was really fun to play with as well. Speaking of monsters <laughs> you do have a, a monstrous image mm -hmm. uh, to, to pair with sort of the three intervals that we've spoken about. And some of you might have seen it, or you might have not. It was behind the, the projection that was in a loop that was um, behind the main projection that you saw. The if you could talk a little bit about why that pairing, why that was an important element to sort of incorporate. Um, so that, that image at the back, where it's uh, basically, it looks like a female body with a barrel on its head. It's got milk coming out of it constantly was what, one of the first images that we f like felt really strongly about when we saw the archways. Um, and I think we're quite happy to leave it open to the interpretation of, of people that see it. But uh, for us, it was about this idea of monstrosity being a fertile spirit, <laughs> um, a fertile ground. And uh, I come from an uh, Indian classical dance background. Um, Vlad comes from a yoga background. and. The idea of an idol or a deity being in a space that holds that space is is quite uh, it's part of the practice. So it just made sense for us that this deity would be there as a as a space for this kind of uncanny unfolding to kind of ground it. And I will move on now to the third interval. Um, and the third interval is just called interval. And there we see you contemporary clothing. Um, sort of persistently moving in a circular sort of motion and it continues it's maybe the one that doesn't stop ever there's always like a stop in the first and the second and this is the one that just the camera stops at a certain point but we see a continuation of your moving body how in the why at the end <laughs> yeah and, and how does that, again, hark back to this idea of the interval or this punctuation, as you put it, um, for the film? So I'm just aware that the interval is a kind of nuanced concept, so I might just describe it again. Like, I'm not sure. But uh, so pausing that question for one second. Um, so if you think of a normal interval, where it's like during a film, it's this pause, right? It's just a space for pause. It's not what came before, it's not what's coming after. So the first way to think about it is it being a pause from the temporal con continuity of whatever story has been told before it. So it's trying to use the body to create a sort of pause, um, which in itself can become a disruption or a subversion or, an ima or a, or a um, celebration but it's, it's a pause. It's a pause from any kind of known before and after that can become anything. Um, and when we first started to play with it was to going into ruins or abandoned sites that were really, had a really strong, uh, as I said, like a, a strong ideological sort of drive to them. And to just create a pause in that, say, well, this space was created for Stalin to walk through and have a bath with his comrades, but for this moment, we're just going to take a pause, and for this moment, it's about this body improvising with a vine in this space. And this was experiment intervals too. Um, and the, the thing about the, the 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 idea of the interval is that that little space can be used. Like when you start to think about creating these pauses in space, creating these little intervals in what's a known environment, 
different potentialities can happen. Now we're talking about it in terms of performance art and we're talking about it in terms of video, uh, in terms of film, um, but an example of it happening in a political way um, is that uh, there was a, there's a pianist called Maria Yudina whose work we used for, for uh, we've worked, we used previously and she was around during Soviet era, uh, um, Stalin's during time. Stalin's time, do you want to tell us? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so it's, it's a bit anecdotal uh, in the sense of like, it's probably not kind of the way that it's been described now. It's probably not exactly the way that it happened, but it still works nicely to kind of give this example. But um, she was a pianist. Uh, she played um, at Mozart, um, which was uh, uh, Stalin's favorite uh, artist. And she, this one piece, which was his favorite, um, he called, um, I think, the orchestra, like in the middle of the night, and said, I want a recording of this. They call. They basically drew the whole the whole orchestra and uh, and the conductor out, and they recorded this. It took them like three sessions. They went through three conductors because everyone was so nervous. And in the end, they sent it to him. Um, so she played piano during during this, and um, he loved it. And he sent her a thank you note with some money. And she ended up writing back so and saying she secretly slipped a note back to Stalin and said. I've donated all your money to church and I'm praying to God for the sins of your soul against the nation. A warrant was set out for her arrest uh, and Stalin chose not to issue the, the arrest. Um, and a perfect example of the interval is that improvised action that she took to send him that letter and the way that it, the potentiality of an interval to reorder power is that he did not he did not exert the power that he normally would have. She should have been on the wall. So you know. it flipped the hierarchy. So it flipped the hierarchy the just for a moment. And so what we're hoping that a body can do when it's in space is just for a moment, even if that's all it is, is to flip our idea of the strength and, and hierarchy that that space imposes. So the final interval, after many, many days and hours of shooting, was the one moment that we both felt where I was able to move out onto that field and not let it overpower me but that I was able to take it and kind of meet its power and therefore in a way uh, I guess recontextualize what it what it was what it what its power was not just over me but over everyone who's watching me and moves became a through me in that. Yeah. yeah so I think back to like the the, the spatiotemporal kind of thing where um, the way kind of I, I see it is, so you have like this, this narrative of a space or of a building and so for a moment she kind of like just cuts through and there's a space and just for a moment it gets changed and it's almost like she's haunting it and so that site will kind of never be the same again, right? And, uh, it's, uh, and it changes the, poten the potentiality of that site and it changes its its previous futures, it changes to a certain extent its past, but it's, it's not the same site anymore. But, like, just by the idea of opening up, say, what can this do? So that's one body moving. What if there's a thousand bodies moving there? You know, it's, it's what, this is one space, like, this is one action. But what happens if every, if there's multiple potentialities of action that unfold improvisationally? So it's just asking and opening that question, and ho we're hoping that that just that for that moment it can feel like a bit of a, a liberation or an emancipation like a reclamation of the space say well no our past doesn't own us and the future that that past says we're supposed to have doesn't own us either you know it's just this moment that that can be an opening for something else there's intervals happening all the time everywhere um, and I think the way we're trying to apply it as a methodology is uh, uh, in relation a little bit to the theory around theories around improvisation uh, and also because I come more from a dance background to kind of try and meet not only with the improvisational act but also a kind of state of being in which uh, you're able to push aside the expectations of yourself and of the space of you as a as a performance or as a as an embodied practice um, so we are applying it very much to, I guess, the moving body and not necessarily the moving body in everyday, uh, in an everyday occurrence, but as a, I guess, as a performance practice or as a performative research practice. 
Um, it's called experiment in intervals. So we're kind of like we're we're defining or we're kind of narrowing. We're playing, yeah. Um, uh, kind of variables and looking at this very very particular phenomenon, which yeah happens all the time. But what happens if we pay like close attention to it and use it as a method? Yeah. It's basically that. Also, the the application of it has made us understand that yes, intervals are happening all the time, but most of the time, even what we improvise is informed by our ideas of the space or the expectations of us or of the meetings of those things. So I think I was speaking to someone before, it's like usually when you ask someone to improvise something, they'll want to do something big or they'll want to, you know, because it's like, what is the most opposite thing I can do to what is expected or what the space asks of me? So there are also times where we find that what I'm doing is actually being quite contrived or being purposefully against the space or purposefully, I'm being purposefully unexpected so I'm not actually in the pure state of unknowing where something might emerge. Um, so this is, it's all part of the experiment, is to understand, like, can you strip that back more and more and more and find a really potent center of how a body reacts in space um, and strip that of the ideas we have of how it should act in space or even how it should improvise. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. We can talk about it afterwards. I, I just wanted to just say one last point to exactly this question. You're right, yes, intervals happen all the time, but yesterday while we were speaking, I think you're alluding to it this entire time as we're speaking, but you also defined an interval as like, um, so reassembling power from an improv improvisational act. And what that means for me is that there's one, an acknowledgement that I'm immersed in a power structure. And if I'm immersed in a power structure, then how do I improvise in ways that are perhaps unexpected, disruptive, idle? The unexpected within a space that has already determined sort of a hierarchy of being, knowing, feeling. So I think it is specific to power. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting because I don't know if someone, like in your example of the piano, like, is so much improvising as that's who she is. Yes. So. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm using improvisation kind of liberally here. I mean it more in, it, it comes back to that idea of the utopia of process, of how, and, and it's how, how do we decide to deal with unpredictability, or how do we decide to negotiate power, or how do we decide, it, how do we decide to deal with, or what, what is the response to, um, yeah, the, a, a situation, and can that, can that response be something that is, and I use the word improvise, but something that is emergent. That, it, that comes from a different place to maybe what is expected. And I agree with you, it, it probably is just part of, part of who she is. But in that moment, that action of who she was uh, in relation to the power structure just temporarily suspended the, the expect or the, the norm. Um, so in that way, I guess it holistically becomes an, uh, an example of the interval, but it's a, it's a fluid concept that kind of, it, it moves around and I think it's that we, we would all have times in our lives where you know that you did something differently or did something unexpected or you, some, you, know, you, you changed your behavior in some way or you I maybe in that inhabited your body or space the way you wish to and it yielded a slightly different response. Um, and that's just, it's that question of, okay, so what happens if you hone in on this more and more and what is its capacity to become a methodology? Um, yeah.